How are you all doing? Raise your hand if you were here last year. Phenomenal returns. Raise your hand if you're here new. Okay, everybody who raised their hand first, look around. Please hold your hands up if you're new. We are a welcoming community. Make eye contact with somebody whose hand is up and commit yourself to help them out. <laughs> help, help them around. They're going to need your help, and we'll talk about ambassadors later. So I want to talk to you today a little bit about who we are, what we do, where we come from, and where we're going. A little bit about our technology and a little bit about our community. Many of you know that I'm a Zen Buddhist. I couldn't help but rip off Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance to talk to you about my favorite platform. So Zen and the Art of Platform. This is an ENSO. Uh, it's uh, something you probably associate with Zen. It's a calligraphic form, and it means emptiness. It also means enlightenment. To me, it means bringing things together, unification. Unification is a theme in open source because open source is a positive sum game, much like love. The more that you offer, the more there is available, the more that you'll get back. So open source works with those exact same economic principles. So in non-zero, Robert Wright wrote, the history of civilization is a history of positive sum games played at larger and larger scales. And then he spends about 300 pages proving it. So he says that the scale of the game is how many people can I call self instead of other? As human beings, we like to draw a bright line between self and other. Other is bad, scary, and we all keep it at arm's length or fight it. And self, of course, is good. We have a lot of trust. We can play games together that are fun and don't cause anybody to lose. The opposite of a positive sum game is a zero sum game in which for me to win, you have to lose. Those aren't actually that exciting. The positive sum game that all of us know is family. It's played with a very small structure of parents and children. Divide the labor. You work together, right? You try to create more than you had before. That's a very simple polity. So if we look at a polity as a structure within which we have that bright line of self and other, we can look at the march of those over time. You have self as a tribe. People here have probably heard of the Dunbar number, about 140, 150 people that you can be in consistent, continuous relationship with. Once you get to a tribe, people survive much better. You have divisions of labor. You have the ability to do simple things like food sharing, or you can have skills. But over time, frictions show up because larger polities get to play larger positive sum games together. So a chiefdom defeats a tribe and absorbs it. A city-state defeats a chiefdom and absorbs it. These translocations, right, these shifts are often very uncomfortable. There's a lot of chaos in them. Now we're at nation-states maybe heading towards a world state. Who knows what that will look like? But as a model, we can just see its economics, right? Game theory shows us that the more people we can call self instead of other, the more successful we are. We've done that in corporations. At one point, we said, well, maybe self is a company. Probably a lot of you feel this way, right? You're some of your best friends, hopefully the people you're spending 50 hours a week with at work, we spend more time doing that than we do with our families. If we walk up the path of evolution of companies, we see sole proprietors, partnerships, LLCs, corporations, multinationals, right? This is sort of the massive scale that we're at in creating positive sum games, right, in these, in these boundaries. What's crazy and new is this open source concept that self can equal project. Right, we look back 20 years, we look at Linux, 15 years, and we talk about the Linux kernel development project. If you're a Linux kernel developer, you look at any other kernel developer, regardless of what company they work at, and you go, wow, that's, that's self. Right? They look at corporate boundaries as if they don't even exist. So as Cloud Foundry establishes itself, as you start to think of yourself as part of Cloud Foundry, all the people sitting around you are friends you haven't yet met. You are playing positive sum games with each of them. This is the unity of the positive sum game of Cloud Foundry. It turns out that it gets even stronger. The more that we think about who we're including in the circle, the more powerful we get. We include developers, users, providers, and operators, all as equal citizens sitting around the ring. Nobody's in the middle, nobody's on the outside. How do we contribute to what this platform needs to become? That's what we built the system for. That's what you're part of. It turns out we can double dip, because not only is open source a positive sum game, but plat platforms are positive sum games. If you look at the structure of a platform, it's the opposite of a traditional business. It's an inverted pyramid of power. It's one in which service to users is the highest virtue. At the bottom, you have a single platform. As you scale up to 
many products, many, many services, many, many, many solutions, and then fulfill the needs of a vast number of users, that whole thing cycles through. The requirements of the users feed back down to the platform through these tiers. As the platform gets better, each of those levels is uplifted. So the more people that we can support, the greater the platform. Platforms drive network effects. It's the most advanced business model we're aware of today. If you're familiar with Uber, if you're familiar with Airbnb, if you're familiar with GE Predicts, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit more very soon, you know that platforms drive network effects. Does anybody know who the greatest salesperson was in history? Actually, we actually don't know that person's name. But the classic network effect uh, is a telephone. One telephone by itself is not that useful. So the greatest salesperson ever sold the first telephone, a completely useless thing sitting on a desk. But you add one more phone, you add one more phone, you add one more phone, and you get exponential growth in the value of being on the phone network. So all of us have experience in network effects. They run away very quickly. They turn into back of the chessboard problems where the exponents start to get out of hand, and you can't even imagine why a company that owns no cars is valued, at, uh, is valued uh, higher than Honda. Recently, Marshall Van Elston, Jeffrey Parker, and Sangeet Paul Chowdhury published this book. It's just out in February, looking at the last 15 years of platforms, digging up the complex economics of them. But they all come down to a very simple solution. The more people we can include in a platform, the greater the network effect. So that brings us back to our opportunity and our responsibility, bringing developers, users, providers, and operators all together. So to achieve that, what, we've, uh, what, what we focused on is understanding the two sides to how platforms grow. As Kishore Swaminathan, who was the chief scientist at Accenture uh, up to 2009, said there's really two sides of this. There's an ecosystem of mutually reinforcing technologies. Right? We all have systems like this. Right? If you're using a mobile phone, you're there because the technologies work together. But you're also there because there's been adoption. Every user coming onto the platform has also driven new demand for new technologies to be built. Those technologies reinforce each other and make it safer for more users to join the platform. So you actually have a flywheel effect where we continue to see it spin. It's what we've seen with Cloud Foundry, and I'll walk you through some of those statistics. But most importantly, we have to focus our own efforts as technologists to understand how we fit inside this system and how do we make it better. An ecosystem of mutually reinforcing technologies really depends on standardization. Otherwise, the connections as you get to that exponential network they become too hard to solve. In computer science, we'd say it's NP-complete. So how do we flatten the curve? How do we reduce the number of connections? Well, we have to standardize. Who here thinks that the light bulb is a great example of standardization? Is that what we should do? OK, yeah. so this is an incandescent light bulb, uh, recently outlawed uh, in places like Australia, um, Dr. Nick, uh, because obviously they're trying to control how much energy is used and how much carbon footprint we have. So what we, what we standardize instead, it turns out, is the socket. If we standardize the socket, not only can we have one set of infrastructure that gets laid in and stays in place for years, technology can advance and we can have very different ideas about what we should put in. Uh, compact fluorescence, also a CF. See what I did there? Um, this is an LED. Uh, all of these use advanced technologies and we get to continue to move the world forward. This particular piece of innovation I'm quite fascinated by. Over the next five years, 80% of the fleet of light bulbs, at least in the United States, will be replaced. This is a once in a century event. Normally, that simply doesn't happen because you just kind of replace them piece by piece. But because there are mandates on how much electricity you can use, how you generate power, we're now putting LEDs in every, every corporate campus, uh, soon every house. What's amazing about these LEDs is they are little computers. They have transistors, and people are adding sensors. They're adding wireless networks. So the future of lighting plugging into, um, sorry, can we go back one? The future of lighting plugging into that, so that standard socket is giving us an internet of sensors by being in the same place, creating mesh networks, giving us access to heat, temperature control, and of course, doing all the processing through a platform, Cloud Foundry. What do we standardize then in the case of the platform in order to achieve this world? We launched in December Cloud Foundry certified. So, what we tried to do in that process is to be able to give a durable infrastructure, something that you could rely on, like a light socket, 
But then software, of course, is more difficult than light sockets because it's complex and it's moving. The cloud is changing all the time, and open source changes all the time. It's a living project, not a dead project. So we time stamped it like a car model. We said, how do you know which Cloud Foundry you're running on, and how do we move the whole ecosystem forward? How do we support everybody in that inverted pyramid? We said, well, certified 2016. So this year, we'll be announcing the requirements for 2017, which will launch next January. With this certification, which certifies the runtime and ensures that you have a consistent API base, and make sure that you have a, a consistent deployment and operator skill set, then we can support this massive platform with Cloud Foundry. And no matter where you go, you will be able to have these exact same guarantees that one Cloud Foundry platform will be able to have tens of thousands of products, hundreds of thousands of services, millions of solutions supporting hundreds of millions of users. This is what we are building. Right? This, is the, this is the vision for our ecosystem. All of this with strong economic activity, keeping us all employed and moving forward, because we have to get paid to work on software. Now, Today, I'm delighted to announce that two more major companies have joined certification. ATOS has just announced ATOS Cloud Foundry. Let's give them a hand. Uh, ATOS is about an $11 billion company with uh, thousands of consultants building out uh, complex cloud solutions. Um, they have been working on Cloud Foundry for many years. They work with Pivotal. They have Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Today, they're certifying ATOS Cloud Foundry, which is their, version of their, uh, their distribution of the open source upstream. Second, um, and it may come as some surprise, because maybe you thought that we were simply the secret batteries inside GE Predicts, the industrial internet of things. But GE Predicts announced today that they certified on Cloud Foundry. So let's give GE a hand as well. So why does all this matter? It matters because of multi-cloud. Each of these companies is helping customers deal with a multi-cloud reality. We don't believe that a single cloud is right for everybody. What we found for, in real life is that, on average, enterprises are using about 4.6 clouds. 4.6 clouds, that's like having 2.4 children in a white picket fence. But multi-cloud is here. It's already happened. It happened before any analyst counted it. It happened before any CIO voted on it or mandated it. It just kind of crept in. So in response to that, Cloud Foundry is the platform supported and built by all of these companies that runs your workloads on multiple clouds. So that's where we are today. It's an awesome place to be, right? Pivotal, HPE, SAP, IBM, ATOS, GE, Swisscom, Huawei, and Centrelink have all achieved technical certification for 2016 means that you own your apps and you can run that workload on any cloud you think best, including 4.6 clouds. But where are we going? Let me, let me take a shot at the horizon. So many platforms support only custom application development. But you know you've got a real platform for the ages when you have packaged apps and packaged services. On the packaged services piece, you want to be able to expand the, uh, the Cloud Foundry platform capability infinitely. So in Cloud Foundry, we've got a phenomenal technology called the CF Service Broker. Uh, and it's bridged by the CF Service Broker API. We found that there's a very significant community, uh, even broader than Cloud Foundry, that admires our Service Broker, wants to plug into it, wants to build more capabilities, and wants to bridge it to other open source projects. This is a huge thing. So our approach to services is becoming an industry standard. Packaged apps should run on any Cloud Foundry. It simplifies the economics for any ISV. Just think about how, how many apps there are on your mobile phone. How many apps did you used to use on your desktop maybe 15 years ago? Probably one-tenth the number of the apps that you have on your mobile phone. Software got smaller. It got right-sized, because there was a very simple deployment target, and there was an effective marketplace, whether you're iTunes or Google Play or whatnot. So our opportunity is to create that kind of simplicity and packaging format for enterprise apps that lets them run on any Cloud Foundry anywhere, creating a unified global application ecosystem. Think of the hundreds of thousands of developers who can build right-sized applications for the enterprise and make enterprise software suck just a little bit less. <laughs> so let's take this forward. Let's focus ourselves as a community and say we're going to continue to push Cloud Foundry forward as the standard. And that standard is going to draw with it a global, economically successful community providing packaged services that can be used by Cloud Foundry deployments anywhere creating economic opportunity for every service developer 
every service provider, whether it's Cassandra or React or Twilio or something custom, um, whether, it's, whether it's CRM systems, whether it's uh, message queues. At the top, let's make sure that we have a packaging format that works for the ISVs, because when ISVs start adopting your platform, they will just drag the platform in there, and you'll be surrounded by Cloud Foundry. Things will just work. To get there, we're going to need velocity. Uh, one of the things that we were challenged with a year ago was if you're going to vastly increase the number of contributors to the project, if you're going to vastly increase the number of members involved, how do we make sure that that project doesn't slow down? Well, I'm very pleased to say that looking back on the last year, our numbers are awesome. Right? They're there in the elite of all open source software projects. Over 2,300 patches by people who are not core committers. Over 2,100 contributors. 130 core committers. Now, let me talk to you about the core committers for a moment. These are the men and women who are engineering their hearts out, working full time on the project. They have commit rights on all of the 17 projects in the open source. Many of them also rotate off and build their own company's uh, extended capability set built around Cloud Foundry. This compares favorably to the number of core committers on, um, on OpenStack, about the same, and to Linux. So many of you might have thought, wow, Linux has got tens of thousands of developers. It's true. But when you start measuring like for like and who's spending all of their time building the project, you'll find that we are, uh, we are neck and neck with the leaders. That's why we've moved so fast. Over 25 releases in the last year, roughly a release every two weeks of a complete working project, which is effectively a product. You can pull from Cloud Foundry upstream, and it will work. It's a release. I mentioned multi-cloud. All of these releases support AWS, Google Cloud Platform, Microsoft Azure, VMware vSphere, OpenStack of various, various flavors, uh, SoftLayer, and RackHD. This is a really big deal because it simplifies the experience for developers. One consistent developer experience on the platform across all these different infrastructures. Now, interestingly, we've, we've had about a release every two weeks. Uh, we've also had a member join about every two weeks. So when we started the foundation, we had about 26 members. Now we have 63. It's pretty awesome. You've seen a number of announcements uh, today, and you'll see more throughout the week. It's also a wonderfully self-organizing community that you're part of. Apart from the big summits that we put on in North America and Europe and in Asia, there are 173 self-organizing user groups with over 3,500 individual members in 105 cities and 48 countries. So this is an awe-inspiring moment for me to be able to look back on the year behind and, and imagine if, these, if this is what we did as a community last year and we're growing, what is, what is this going to look like next year? So let me close by bringing you back to our collective vision, right? What, what is Cloud Foundry about? Who are you as part of this community? We see a world of cloud computing that is ubiquitous and flexible. It supports multi-cloud application environments. It's portable and interoperable, enabling users to move their applications wherever they need to go. And it's vibrant and growing, underlying a massive ecosystem of applications and services. Most importantly, and as we come together as a community, I want you to recognize the standards we hold for ourselves. Right? We see a human community that is pragmatic and focused on exchanging practical experience. It's diverse and inclusive of people across race, gender, orientation, and lifestyle. We take this tremendously seriously. We take it as our responsibility and our privilege. And finally, we're respectful. We're committed to listening to thoughtful and honest perspectives. So with that, I offer you Zen and the Art of Platform. Welcome to the conference. Have a fantastic time. Thank you. Now, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to pause for a moment uh, before we bring doc Dr. Nick back on stage. And I'm going to say we have the privilege of hosting some truly committed individuals, people who have been part of the Cloud Foundry community, in, in some case for years, who have volunteered themselves, their times, and their, go and, and their goodwill to support all of us in the journey. So today, we're announcing the Cloud Foundry ambassadors. And I would like all of the ambassadors who are seated in the, in the crowd, especially those in the front, uh, please come and join me on stage so that the community can see you together. And let's give them a big hand as they come on. We'll see if the stage is big enough. We might need a bigger boat. Dr. Nick, you're Australian. You should tell us how to stand. Like this. On our heads. 
Keep coming, there's more room. Now I feel awkward. All right, so Mark, would you hold up your badge? So can, uh, can you focus the camera on the red ambassador tag? So if you, if you can't instantly memorize the faces uh, of every single person on stage, we have helpfully provided you with an API. What's that API, you might ask? It's a little red sticker at the bottom of the tag. So if you see anybody with the red tag, you could stop them and thank them for being ambassadors. You could ask them simple questions, or you could ask, ask them complicated questions. So here's the Cloud Foundry ambassadors. They will continue past this conference. This is where we're kicking it off. Please give them a very warm thank you. All right, Dr. Nick, over to you. Off you go. Come on. <laughs>